I got to the infamous line. People who love this book are gonna kill me. It's just so infuriating. TikTok has been taking over the book world. We've seen BookTok do it all, from Barnes & Noble tables all the way to New York Times articles. It even has a Google inline section dedicated to its best recommendations. In good nature, I had to do my research. What books were the most recommended by TikTok and which ones were potentially going to be worth my time? So, I scoured the internet, watched every book talk imaginable, made my own list, May you guys vote on TikTok's favorite books. And today, I am going to read them. Well, not today, but just for dramatic effect. I had to do it. This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Squarespace is the platform to build your own sites, with hundreds of templates to choose from, from podcasts all the way to online shops. There are features such as email campaigns, collecting donations, social sharing, member areas, and blogging tools provide all you need to freely manage your ventures and grow as a brand. On top of that, their analytics tools will help you gain powerful insights into who's visiting your site and how they're interacting with your content, which is arguably one of your most invaluable assets. Head to squarespace.com slash to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain using code MELREADS. As you can see right there, I have a stack of books that have been selected for this video. I am going to be reading a total of five books, if only for the sake that I would go insane if I read more than five books for a single video. But after searching high and low for books that TikTok, I had to do it. I'm sorry. Loves, I have a list, I have books, and you guys actually helped. So about two weeks back, I posted a very ominous story asking you guys to choose a number. You guys had no idea what that number was for, and today you get to find out because you guys actually chose one of the books for this video and for the citadel my patrons hello i also made you guys choose a number without knowing what that was and today you're gonna find out what you voted for interestingly enough as a result of both of these polls the same number one i also divided which genres each would get to choose and for my instagram you guys voted for a contemporary novel and for my patreon you guys got to vote on which fantasy book i would read in this video and so for the the contemporary pick that Instagram chose for me out of all of the book talk books that I will get to read in a YouTube video, I will be reading Darius the Great is Not Okay. And for the fantasy, I will get to read Furyborn. Now this was obviously not enough for me. I needed more. And so I added out of my own volition, three more books that I'm interested in reading that I've seen everywhere on book talk based on my research. The first book I am adding myself is Cersei. Another contemporary I am adding to the list and that is Reminders of Him by Colleen Hoover, which is her newest release and the book that everybody is obsessing over right now. And last but not least, and the one I believe will be the most interesting, Serpent and Dove. And so for the next two weeks, without you guys knowing, I'm gonna be reading Book Talk books. And to kick things off on the best manner, I'm gonna be reading Darius the Great is Not Okay. Let's find out if Book Talk actually has some taste. tell you. I am currently about 60-ish percent through. I'm on page 189 and I can totally see why people love this book so much. I myself am enjoying this a lot. We follow Darius who is a teenager and he is half white, half Persian. So he is not as in tune with his Persian side as he'd like to be. And I think throughout the entirety of what I have read, you can clearly tell that inner struggle, that inner battle between the fact that he didn't grow up as knowledgeable in this culture or as in tune with it, even close to his family, that lives in Iran versus being more connected towards his dad's side, I guess. Not necessarily his dad's side of the family, but more so his dad as an individual. And even growing up, you can tell that his mom has really favored his younger sister, Lale, who grew up learning Farsi, who grew up talking very directly to their grandparents, and who is so much more well-versed within the culture versus Darius himself. And so it's definitely a very heartfelt journey that him as a character has had to go through in this novel. But I think where this book has been 
been going has been really great towards him realizing that it's never too late to connect to that side of his family, which I think is a great message, especially for people who grew up with family elsewhere and would have wanted so much more out of their childhood and the connection to that culture. It really never is too late to connect to that. And I love the message through Darius in that particular regard. And I just finished this chapter and it literally broke my heart where his grandparents basically said, do you not know what that means? Like, do you not, do you not understand Farsi even that well? And they were about to blame his mom. And Darius said, I'm just going to stay quiet because I don't want to make my mom feel bad or guilty over the fact that I did not receive the same treatment in terms of Persian culture as my sister. Y'all, that shit broke my heart when I read that. I was like, oh no. <laughs> I was sitting there, I was listening to the audiobook because I am listening to the audiobook. And I was like, Darius, baby, you got this. You're going to learn. You're going to connect. You're going to meet all the people. And I can already feel how this journey, how this traveling moment has been changing his life in so many good ways. And I also love the writing style for this because it's the best mix of heartfelt moments, but also really comedic remarks, particularly with Darius and his father. They really like Star Trek and Lord of the Rings, and they just kind of bond over that a lot. They've created movie marathons that they watch together every night. And so I love that even though that relationship does not come without its faults, that he has had that in his life. And the other thing about this book that I absolutely love is the mention of mental health, particularly with depression. It is something that not only Darius is going through, but his father as well. And that is something that he has remarked several times is one of the other things that they have in common. And one other thing that separates him from his Persian side of the family. And again, it's very heartbreaking and it's very heartbreaking to see kind of his inner monologue trying to figure out where depression comes from, especially when he says, I grew up with everything and I am not an unhappy person. So why is it that my body just has this chemical reaction? So whenever he's talking about that internally, it's just been hitting so hard that it makes my heart burst. And again, just makes me want to give him the biggest hug ever. I am definitely going to finish this today. I have sprints with my patrons at seven. So in about an hour, but so far, so good. Hi, I have finished the first book of the video and I am most definitely giving this four stars. There was this really emotional moment, really just moments, plural, at the end between Darius and his dad and just acknowledging that, yes, while they're similar in some ways, as Darius likes to explain throughout the entirety of the book, there are also so many differences between them that make them wholly individuals. And I love that recognition towards the end and I also love how they managed to open up to each other in a way that they hadn't really been able to do in the past and just his dad also kind of providing an explanation as to why some things or some dynamics switched in their families when Lale was born. Darius really thought that he kind of needed this moment of going to Iran to truly like find himself and change who he was because I, I personally think that as a lot of teenagers might think which definitely happened to me when I was younger I thought that I had to go on this whole exploration path because I thought there was like something wrong with me, something that I had to change with my attitude in order to like make more friends or maybe fit in a little bit better. And what I didn't understand at the time was that you don't need to change and you don't need to, again, change your identity and who you are and how you behave just for others, just to digest you quote unquote better. And so I like that realization that Darius had at the end of, you know, maybe I changed during this trip and maybe I didn't, but I'm, I'm Darius and I will present myself and behave however I see fit in the moments that just feel right and if people like it cool and if people don't cool and now to switch the genres a little bit and just you know throw you guys up for a loop I'm gonna start this book because I think out of all of them I'm just really curious to see how this one's gonna go down because I've heard really bad things and really great things as well I'm gonna be starting Serpent and Dove I'm terrified a little bit
I got to the infamous line and it's so random. So obviously I've been reading Serpent and Dove. I will give this book credit where credit is due, I guess, if it's any credit to be handed. It's very easy to read and it's almost like an addicting, bingeable read. Objectively the best one? Absolutely not, but at least it's entertaining. But I got to the big titty litty line and I am confused about why this is a thing. She really said, it's not like I stripped and sang big titty litty and I just have so so many questions. However, things that I have taken away from this book so far. This author is obsessed with italics for absolutely no reason. This book is so dramatic for absolutely no reason. And I can't stop reading it for absolutely no reason. I don't know how else to explain this to you guys, but the worst and best kind of read all at the same time, where it's like you just don't have to think as you read, so you just keep turning the page. But also a book where there's just not a lot of objectively good writing if that makes sense. I am excited though to see where this goes. However, the patriarchy in this one is really just present and voting at all times. Every man in this book is absolute trash. The world building is pretty straightforward. I think it's just really playing it off with the regular sort of witchcraft stories that we know. Women were burned at the stake. They were villainized by the church and men. It's another book that I'm reading and I don't know what else to say but that. Big Titty Liddy was not very pretty, but her bosom was big as a barn. Her creamery knockers drove men off their rockers, but she was blind to their charms. This is like listening to MJK rap. Like what? The what is happening? I, you know what I wish? I wish somebody would do like a demo of the song. Like what would the instrumental sound like? What would the backing track be? Hello, lovely. I am officially 90 pages away from the end of Serpent and Dove. And see, this is where I cannot seem to make up my mind. I literally just told my brother earlier that this book is not good, but it's addicting at the same time. And I really want to read the sequel, but the book is not good. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, this book is literally giving me like two star feels, but I want to keep going. From a level of one to astronomical, like how bad is that sentence? However, I'm really enjoying this, even though again, it's like not objectively good. And I also will not not rate this very highly. I will say what this book has going for it is the fact that the world is very interesting. I do think there's a certain lack of development to the world and I do wish we were getting more of that. But what we are getting of the world is really interesting. How the magic works is interesting. The conflict is interesting. I just think the author has been kind of focusing on the wrong things. Big Titty Liddy and Big Willy Billy. <laughs> Why are these a thing? And I can see how it appeals to so many people because like the fantasy romance aspect of it and the enemies to lovers hate to love, you know, witch hunter and witch romance situation. I can see how it's appealing, but um, the development between Reed and Lou. Let's talk about it. I don't know how they got to the point of loving each other. I don't know if I ever saw within this book the actual development towards them moving past the hatred and the prejudice and all that good stuff, I guess. I also feel like the declaration of love just kind of happened out of nowhere, but literally at the core of their relationship, both for Lou and for Reed. It's literally like seeing MGK and Eminem fight it out when the diss tracks came out. Diss me one second, compliment me in the next line or whatever Eminem says in Kill Shot. That is literally what this book feels like. Y'all really be trying to hate each other, but in the very next line, you're like, well, he's kinda hot though. We're gonna read the last 90 pages of this and then I'm probably gonna buy the sequel because I'm as much of a contradiction as the main characters in this story. So maybe I won't read the sequel. See, when you already think a book is gonna be rated low, you don't expect it to get worse worse when it's gonna end. Except that when everybody in unison starts chanting Big Titty Liddy as if they're in a Queen concert just singing We Are The Champions. Why? <laughs> Why? I have so many questions. The ending to this book is probably one of the worst endings to any book that I have read in my life. I don't think I'm gonna be reading Blood and Honey <laughs> if anybody's interested in knowing. That rhymed. Look at me. Big Titty Liddy's got some competition in town. I think I'm just 
just gonna rate this 1.5 stars. The 0.5 is for entertainment and somewhat interesting world building that was barely in the book as it was. Some smut, I don't know what else, but it's generous. It, it's generous. I'm not gonna yuck on your yum. You know, if you love this, I am nobody to tell you. Don't love this. We'll see. Maybe I will end up reading Blood and Honey at some point. When have I ever been anything but the queen of bad decisions and impulsive purchases when it comes to books? So maybe I will end up doing it. I don't know what to read next. I did ask you guys on Instagram and it's tied. <laughs> I will let this simmer overnight to see what happens and then tomorrow morning before sprint I shall pick something out and see what I end up reading then. Good morning everybody. So I was checking the Instagram poll when I woke up. The crown and the sword were winning and it's funny because one of my patrons sent me a DM and she's like Mel you already know if there's a sword it's winning and she's not lying. However that means that I'm starting Miss of Furyborn so let us set up let us get ready and let us start reading this book. Good morning, friends. I am barely awake. I just showered, clearly. Washed the hair, not the cutest look. I look like a wet dog right now. However, things are not going that good. I started Furyborn on Sunday. I don't know what it says about me or this book. When I enjoyed Serpent and Dove more, but I gave that 1.5 stars. I loved this when I initially started it. I was so hyped for it. The prologue or the first chapter. Yeah, it's a prologue. So the prologue for this was fantastic. The beginning lines of this is, some say the queen was frightened in her last moments, but I like to think that she was angry. The queen stopped screaming just after midnight. That is a fantastic opening to a book, especially a fantasy book. You're wondering why she's screaming, what's happening? And so we started out with Riel's POV and then we switched switch to another POV, which is Eliana's. And I really liked how the beginning of that chapter two was very much mirroring that first prologue that we got. I say it as if there were more than one prologue, but you know what I'm trying to say. And so right off the bat, those two things were really interesting. I liked how at the focal point of the story, we've got this sort of war between angels and humans and how eventually the human race will be driven to extinction, whether by one of the queens or the angels themselves. I think the conflict is really interesting. I also think the world is really interesting, except when when it wasn't. It's a book that's very repetitive. I think I read the line, the Imperium is in all living things like a million fucking times. And at this point, I swear to you guys, I read this one more time and I will not only throw this book out the window, I might just eat myself out the window too, because I cannot read that line one more time before I go insane. It's also gone down this very cheesy fan fiction-y rabbit hole with the main topic of the book, which is a prophecy. You can see it right here, two queens will arise. Just listen to this. The gate will fall, the king recited. The angels will return and bring ruin to the world. You will know this time by the rise of two human queens, one of blood, one of light. Just, just reading it out loud makes me want to just like laugh. One with the power to save the world. Can you guess what comes next? One with the power to destroy it. Two queens will rise, as if it wasn't already clear. They will carry the power of the seven. They will carry your fate in their hands. Can you guess what comes next? Two queens will rise. It is literally so cheesy and it's literally the focal point of the book. It's repeated over and over and over again and this queen is just wondering, am I the blood queen? Am I the light queen? Which one will I be? And I just don't think I'm in the mood for this. I think with the right mood, I would enjoy this a little bit better. But between that and between what I already assume will be the plot twist of this book that I cannot fathom not happening, it's predictable. Do I have the patience at the moment? to find out what will happen, not necessarily. I will also say I am so much more invested in Riel's POV than I am in Eliana's. I just don't like these sort of thief, bounty hunter main characters that are just parading around town trying to, oh my God, save my mom because she was abducted. What am I gonna do? Not interesting to me. And it's just so very common YA where something, either the parents are dead or something happens to the parents because Lord for forbid a parent being present in a fantasy book. That's what's happening right now on Eliana's POV. And when I tell you guys, I could not care less. It's also, and the way that I phrased it to my best friend last night was, it's a very interesting plot written in a very mediocre way, executed in the most drawn out way possible. People who love this book are gonna kill
kill me. So that's where I stand with Fury Born. And that's not to say that I've read a lot of this book. I'm currently 50% through this book. And every time I sit down to read this, I am just dreading it. I'm gonna have to DNF this for now because just know myself. And I know that if I keep reading this book, I will drag out this video for too long. And I simply cannot do that. I am going to softly DNF this. However, I just need a book right now where I don't have to think. Also, it's release week for House of Sky and Breath. So you already know what the one thing I want to read is. So I'm not even going to make myself read anything that I don't want to be reading right now because we're not going to do that. And also, I would very much like to have these books finished by the time that House of Sky and Breath gets here. So I'm going to be starting Reminders of Him by Colleen Hoover in the hopes that this will give me not necessarily what I need, but just a nice reading experience. I've heard that this is really good. So we'll see if the people are lying or not because I will, I will call people out. Let us go. Let us read and let us find out if TikTok is right. This book is so sad, y'all. <laughs> crying. I'm on page 142, so I'm about to start chapter 21, and when I tell y'all, I was reading this, and I was not expecting to cry, because I think I was more mad than anything, particularly at Ledger and Scotty's parents. It's such a difficult position to be in, first of all, because the whole premise of the book is Kenna has just recently come out of prison by involuntary manslaughter. They were in a car accident, her and Scotty, and Scotty unfortunately passed away. She has a daughter with him, and so now she's kind of back in town hoping to reconnect with her daughter that she never even got to hold when she gave birth to her and her whole visitation rights have been revoked she doesn't even have any parental rights really to her daughter and it's so sad to see her walk into this town fully with the attitude of bettering herself and hoping to rectify her mistakes and to make a life out of herself she's never really had anything and she is hoping to kind of build her life from the ground up even if it's with a minimum wage job. She doesn't even have a phone. She doesn't have a car. She barely even has like a driver's license. Seeing how rough her life is and in what conditions she is living right now, given her, you know, dynamic shift to see Ledger and Scotty's parents. And again, it's a very difficult situation because as a parent, as a best friend, there is no line to be drawn on how you feel because at the end, like feelings are valid and you can't really control how you personally feel about certain things. And in particular, in this case, you've got them just having preconceived notions of who Hannah is. She's the troublemaker, the one who smokes, the one who drinks, the one who, again, involuntarily, accidentally murdering, in a way, their son. And so when it comes to that, it's like infuriating to see them completely misjudge Hannah and her character and the motive of why she's here. Like, she's not there to take her daughter away from them. She's just there to try and reconnect, to even just see. Like, she'll settle just for seeing her daughter and just to see them be as harsh on her as their being is literally breaking my heart because you kind of see both sides of it, right? You see the pain of a mother who never really got to connect with her child and then you also see the pain of another set of parents which in many ways, again, mirror each other but you've got another set of parents who lost to their child and the only connection they have to that child now is this little girl and so it's really heartbreaking and then you enter Ledger into the equation and Ledger is equally not as bad because it's not a bad thing but he adopts the same attitude as the parents do where he's like Kenna like means trouble and like I don't like her at all and like she can go die in a ditch and it's like no it's just so infuriating especially because like you understand both sides of it but it doesn't make it any less sad or, or infuriating the only thing I don't know how I feel towards is the whole romance thing because there is some sort of like budding attraction between Ledger and Kenna which is is it the right place to intro this sort of relationship not really but otherwise it's it's like so sad. <laughs> like chapter 20 broke my heart. I will say yet again, Colleen Hoover has like this obsession to make people just be attracted to each other like right away and be like, nobody is more beautiful than this person. I'm like, bitch.
Y'all, they saw a pigeon. They saw a pigeon. I will get myself together and come back, but I just had to. They saw the freaking white pigeon in the backyard. It was so sad. <laughs> it was so sad in the same, not in the same way, but I found that this hit very similar to how All Your Perfects hit, which you guys know is my favorite Coho book. I think Colleen Hoover, and to nobody's surprise, has been very hit or miss for me, but this is definitely one of those books that I really, really enjoyed. I still don't know how I feel about the romance side of this book, although everything else I felt was good. The romance side of it took away from everything else that could have been happening regarding Kenna and her daughter, but everything else I think flowed really nicely as Colleen Hoover typically does. The book was written really beautifully. I just, again, I think it's the romance that's like really preventing me from giving this a five star. And just because as well as every other romance contemporary book out there, it seems that the conflict takes place in the entirety of the book. It always reduces down to miscommunication or lack of understanding and then within the last 20 pages of the book everything resolved so that's one of my personal pet peeves with like this sort of genre and I found that it was still present in this book unfortunately so prevented me from giving it a five star but it was still a really good book and I still found it really enjoyable and it was just really beautiful to see I think finally the journey of a mother who genuinely cares for her daughter and who genuinely wants the best for her and who wants to get her life back regardless regardless of what she has to do like she will do just about anything for her daughter and just seeing that beautiful bond take place in this book without her really knowing or having properly met her daughter was something that was just absolutely beautiful and heartbreaking all at the same time and just seeing also Kenna's journey towards forgiving herself about Scotty was again beautiful and heartbreaking simultaneously and this was really really good and so now because House of Sky and Breath is still not here I am going to start Cersei and honestly I read some of Achilles quite quick I almost read it I mean if you kind of spread it out it was a few days but if you put everything together in terms of our count it was less than a day so i'm hoping that i can finish this maybe by tomorrow morning i found that song of achilles read quite easily and i know that madeline miller's works tend to be very hit or miss like you either love one or the other but i've seen very few people love both so we'll see what happens with miss cersei but i'm really excited to read this and again seeing what happens if the same sort of writing style is here as it was in song of achilles see this like <laughs> can you guys see that like what in the world like it the pages come completely loose at the top for every single one i don't know tiktok culture but i do know one thing because my best friends cannot stop saying it and i know exactly the vibes that this is giving and it's literally oh no the table it is broken same shit different toilet good morning friends how are we doing today <laughs> so i am reading cersei obviously first of all i cannot believe that my book came here damaged i did not realize up until i started reading it yesterday and it's bad like every time i turn the page like it just tries to come loose so i'm not reading the physical just because if i I was I think this book would be up in shreds right now but I'm listening to the audiobook and I'm officially 60% through the book I was really excited to read this Madeline Miller won me over with Tongue of Achilles even though at first I was kind of doubtful about what was gonna happen with the book if I was really gonna enjoy it ended up loving it this one mm. Not so much. I am not loving this as much as I loved Song of Achilles. And I think a lot of it is boiling down to this being such a passive narrative that it's not really compelling at all for me. And I think this book is in comparison to Song of Achilles. If you don't care for Cersei in the slightest, especially it being told in first person, there is an incredibly small likelihood that you're gonna enjoy this book. And for me right now, I am not caring for Cersei at all. I think she's a very interesting concept as a character. She is 
witch. She's somebody who is sort of vengeful towards men, turning them into swines, turning them into pigs, all that fun good stuff. You do you, boo. I genuinely, there is nothing that Cersei is doing right now that is making me care for her. She's stuck in an island. We hear about her sexual conquests and then about her magic. And it's just a repeated process over and over again. It's almost like this vicious cycle, which I understand how it could be that because she is, again, stuck in an island. I'm kind of on the fence and feeling kind of lukewarm about this one. The lyrical, whimsical writing is still present and it's still very competent. I wouldn't expect anything less out of Miller. So that is not my issue. I think it's just an execution that I'm just not clicking with the story at all. I guess my opinion doesn't really matter in the subject because everybody loves this book. It is. Like, it's a book I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see what happens when I reach 66%. That's when I'm gonna hope that this story picks up real quick, real soon, and that some real action starts happening because that is the last 33 and a third. Hello friends, hello. So I am here to update you on the last book of this video, which is Cersei. I didn't love Cersei as much as I expected to love it given Song of Achilles. I also think that in their execution, they're vastly different. Obviously completely different narratives. However, I don't think this was on par with what I read in that first Madeline Miller book, that first experience. Read this book, but I definitely think that it's a book and this is the strange part, right? I had such a turbulent experience reading this. The book is literally falling apart. Like if I open this, the pages are literally ripping at the seams at the top of the book. And so I had to listen to the audiobook in order for me to actually get through this one. And I believe that even though the audiobook was really well recorded and that the voice was really whimsical and lyrical, just like the writing, I don't think it was the right format for me at least to consume this book for the first time. And so I definitely think if I re-experience this in the future physically and I'm actually holding the book and reading the words. I have the potential of enjoying it a lot more, hopefully, maybe in the future. I also think that knowing what I'm getting myself into will be very helpful. I think I had a lot of expectations given, again, my first read of a Madeline Miller book and how this could also potentially go down. And sadly, it didn't end up delivering on what I expected this book to do. I found my brain to be really scattered in my reading experience of this and constantly wondering, me having to constantly rewind and just backtrack because I could not focus on what the narrator was was saying. I was just not hooked to the story at all. And whether that's me not really enjoying the audiobook experience of this, or even the narrative being too passive, which it definitely was, and it was very repetitive. I felt like I was listening to something on loop. Whatever the case was, this just wasn't really interesting. I will say, though, the Minotaur scene in this book, if Madeline Miller wanted to write a horror anything, I would absolutely buy it and believe it, because that shit was gnarly and disgusting and really, really graphic in a way that I wasn't expecting. And again, that's not to say that Madeline Miller is not well-researched. Like, she knows her mythology. This is what she studied in college. And so I'd expect nothing less from her than even just an average tale that I didn't necessarily connect to. But something that's very cool. And even though, again, I didn't really vibe with this, like, it's still a very cool story. And all of the mythos is really well indebted in here. I just think her writing in this one was running circles around sentences without actually panning into anything, which was really, really annoying and confusing, especially in all audio format. And so while this is really well researched and contains the somewhat magic of Madeline Miller and her competence, didn't vibe with it. And I think that's what it reduces down to. I just personally didn't like it. And I also think, as opposed to Song of Achilles, this book was very telly. And I know there's a lot of arguments about whether books should be telly or showy, but in reality, they should be a mix of both. And I think this book really relayed the message onto the reader instead of having us be in the book, immersed in the book. I felt like there was just a story being told to me and I just had to kind of embrace that and I think maybe that's partly why I felt such a disconnect with the story and maybe it's all due to the fact that this is told in first person so I just feel like Cersei herself is telling me the story but just not in a very interesting way and my other qualm with this is that it's called an epic but there's absolutely nothing epic about this and I think it's all due to the fact that Cersei for the majority of this book is stuck on an island and so every epic story that we get is being told to Cersei 
or is being told to other people and the book is essentially just a bunch of stories being told to characters in the book and to us as a reader and that screams everything but epic but for now I'm settling for a three star like it's not a bad book but it's also not a stellar book it's definitely not an epic I can tell you that let's do a little rundown of everything that I read in this video and what my final thoughts are in all of these and what my final ranking would be I've never done a ranking in one of these videos but I think it's gonna be pretty fun for this one because there are more than two books so as far as ratings and rankings go I think this is going to be my final ranking and this is ranking in terms of enjoyment and not necessarily rating at the top we've got reminders of him this was definitely my favorite book that I read in this bunch it made me emotional I cried and it just made me really invested into the story then we've got Darius the Great is not okay which I was also emotionally invested in I was invested in the growth of the character the narrative was super compelling and I think it's a really fantastic coming-of-age YA story then we've got Serpent and Dove which I arguably didn't rate very high it was the lowest rated book of the video but in terms of entertainment I think it's one of those books that you can just sit down and binge and not really think about anything and whilst yes there is a lot of things to hate in the narrative there are also quite a few bits that are quite interesting and entertaining in a way that you'd sit and watch a bad movie and not really put it off because you have nothing else to watch or read at the moment as a source of entertainment then I've got Fury Born which I'm still putting in the ranking because I read a lot of it and although I have DNF'd it I will pick it back up to finish it to see where it goes I just found that it was very cheesy YA in a way that I wasn't really expecting after a really fantastic prologue and then last but not least Cersei because although I gave it a three star it didn't really do anything for me so for ratings it is reminders of him as a 4.5 we've got Dyer's the Great is not okay at four stars Serpent and Dove at a 1.5 <laughs> Fury Born as a two star even though I didn't necessarily Necessarily finish it but I am rating it because I read most of it and potentially my rating could change and then last but not least Cersei at a three star and that was my ranking and my ratings for all of these books I hope that you guys enjoyed this video if you did don't forget to give it a massive thumbs up and comment down below I am super curious to know what are those books that you've read because of book talk and if you've read any of these what have you personally thought what are your takes did you enjoy these books did you not enjoy these books let us spill all the tea down in the comments I am super excited to chat with you guys but every Everything book talk related and if there are any other books that you saw in my research process or that you've seen personally on book talk that you'd be really interested in me trying out let a girl know because I am always up for a part two of this video and also subscribe for more bookish content that is always happening in this corner of the internet and if you want to support the channel further I do have a patreon we call ourselves the citadel we do monthly readathons exclusive live streams exclusive videos book clubs a buddy reads and everything and anything in between and it is always the best time over there so if you do want to join us that is linked down below alongside all my social medias and yes i love you guys so so much and i shall see you on the next one bye guys